Your Eminence Archbishop Dimitrios, Your Graces, Reverend Fathers, Distinguished Archons, Brothers and Sisters in Christ. The first thing that we learn as students of history is that there is a difference between history and the past. The past is something that took place and is inaccessible except through artifacts and, and documents and, and memories, but not so reliable uh, in the case of memories. History, on the other hand, is an interpretation of the past. It is a construction of the past. And this construction of the history of His Eminence Archbishop Iacobus of Blessed Memory could not have been done without the invaluable service of the archives of our archdiocese. Mrs. Nikki Kale has worked with me and has been very patient with me in uh, helping me mine the archives and to discover and to unearth many things that have been stored and thankfully very safely in the revered archives of our archdiocese. So I, I thank Mrs. Kale, and I also would like to thank Father Nathaniel for this opportunity, and I pray that it is uh, informative and inspirational to you all. On April 1st, 1959, the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople enthroned Iakovos Kukuzis as the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of North and South America. His primary task was to oversee the pastoral, liturgical, and cultural administration of the Greek Orthodox communities in the Western Hemisphere. Little did he or any of his flock know at the time of his elevation that by 1965, he would become an iconic figure of the nonviolent civil rights movement. At the time of his enthronement, the civil rights movement was well underway in the United States. In 1954, the Supreme Court had ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional in Brown v. Board of Education. In December of 1955, Rosa Parks refused to surrender her seat on a city bus to a white man that triggered the Montgomery bus boycott. In 1957, Martin Luther King Jr. formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference which would play a prominent role in the civil rights movement. In September of 1957, nine African-American students under the protection of federal troops integrated an all-white high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. In April of 1960, college students in Greensboro, North Carolina, conducted lunch counter sit-ins at establishments that served meals to white patrons only, leading to the founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC. The Congress of Racial Equality, a civil rights group, also known as CORE, came into existence in 1942, but they organized Freedom Rides in 1961 through several states of the Deep South. The efforts of African Americans toward integration, equality, and civil rights met an often violent resistance from white Southerners. Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent response to the beatings, the bombings, and unjust arrests served to amplify the hostilities inflicted upon African Americans. During Archbishop Iacobus's first four years, he focused his attention primarily on the internal, internal issues of the Greek American church. Greek Americans were an ethnic community that after decades of discrimination had by the 1960s integrated into the broader American community. Nevertheless, he was sensitive to the plight of African Americans in their struggle for civil rights. Archbishop Iacobus himself experienced prejudice and discrimination while growing up in Turkey. 
He often spoke about the bitter oppression he and the Greeks before him suffered under the Ottomans for over 400 years. He also knew of the nativist attitudes and attacks against Greek American immigrants at the beginning of the 20th century in this country. Finally, he wholeheartedly believed that all human beings, regardless of race, were created in the image of God, and thus believed that all were equally deserving of human and civil rights. Before coming to this presentation, the reconstruction of this paper and this presentation is specifically on the years 1959 to 1965 and involve how Archbishop Iacobos aided and participated in the civil rights movement that unexpectedly elevated him and our archdiocese to national prominence. Before becoming Archbishop, Iacobos served the Greek Orthodox Church in the United States as a clergyman from 1939 to 1954. In 1954, the ecumenical patriarch Athena the I summoned him to Constantinople and there elevated him to the episcopacy to be his personal representative at the World Council of Churches in Geneva, Switzerland. Archbishop Iacobus spent five years in this auspicious position, serving two terms as president of the council. One of his major achievements as president of the WCC was to initiate ongoing dialogue on behalf of the ecumenical patriarch with leaders of various Christian faiths for the express purpose of promoting Christian unity. In this capacity, Archbishop, the then Metropolitan Iacobos developed close professional and personal ties with many religious leaders of all faiths from across the globe. Many of these friendships continued for years. It was during this time in Geneva that Metropolitan Iacobos met the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. approximately 10 years before they were to meet again in Selma, Alabama. Shortly after his elevation, Archbishop Iacobos resolved to transform the Greek Orthodox Church from, in America from an isolated immigrant church into the fourth major religious body of this nation. He would continue to serve as one of the six presidents of the World Council of Churches and would join the National Council of Churches in 1960, and especially its Commission on Religion in, and Race in 1963, and the National Conference of Christian and Jews, promoting the ecumenical movement both within and outside of the Greek Orthodox Church. Finally, Archbishop Iacobos believed that the Orthodox Church had to enter into the American arena of socio-political issues and publicly express its opinion. During the early 1960s, one of the most critical domestic issues in the United States was race relations. Despite the fact that almost a century after passage of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution that defined and granted United States citizenship, and the 15th Amendment that protected the right to the vote, African Americans continued to suffer discrimination, segregation, and unequal civil rights. Since the mid-1950s, the mobilization of African American civil rights organizations scored substantial victories in their pursuit of defeating the Jim Crow laws. But progress was slow, and many whites were defiant to acquiesce, especially in the South. Racial integration was also an issue for many Christian churches in the United States in the mid 20th century. The vast majority of African Americans worshiped in Protestant evangelical Christian denominations. Though most were Baptists, many were members of the Methodist, Presbyterian, and Episcopal churches. Smaller percentages were Roman Catholic. Like businesses, schools, and neighborhoods, 
the churches had African American communicants, but also struggled with the issue of segregation. Some exercised a Jim Crow-like separate but equal practice of allowing African Americans their own churches with their own clergy, or select seating areas for blacks in predominantly white parishes. In parishes where there was Holy Communion, often the white congregants would receive communion first, and then the African American. Others, other churches strive to integrate their churches, irrespective of race. Racial integration was not an internal problem for the parishes of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, because very few African Americans were communicants at that time. Even by the mid-20th century, the parishes of the Archdiocese concentrated their energies on perpetuating the Greek Orthodox faith, language, and culture. Although racial conflict was not an issue within the Greek American churches, it certainly was in many of the neighborhoods where these churches existed. The earliest documented inquiry made to the Archdiocese concerning its position on race was from a group of University of Chicago theology students in 1958, approximately five months before his eminence became Archbishop. Responding on behalf of the Archdiocese, Arthur Dorr, then Director of Public Relations, wrote, and I quote, the Greek Orthodox Church has always been a most democratic church without prejudice in preference to race or color. At present, the question of segregation in the United States is not a problem because there are no appreciable number of color communicants in this country. However, there are many members of the Greek Orthodox Church who are colored in other countries, and these members are accepted in good standing without any discrimination whatsoever. We might add that the late Archbishop Michael often expressed himself in public and in writing that the Greek Orthodox Church in America is opposed to any segregation or racial prejudices, end quote. As marches, sit-ins, freedom rides, boycotts continued to escalate throughout the southern United States, these actions invigorated the National Council of Churches to use its religious and political influence to speak out against segregation and racial bigotry. As Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference and other civil rights organizations sought political action to end discrimination and segregation, in the South, the National Council of Churches sought to do the same from the pulpits of the North. Archbishop Iacobos returned, retained his presidency in the World Council of Churches. He also became a distinguished leader in the National Council of Churches. Since 1923, the National Council of Churches Department of Racial and Cultural Relations encouraged its member churches to observe Race Relations Sunday. In its 39th observance, scheduled to take place on February the 11th of 1962, Archbishop Iacob was called upon the parishes of the Archdiocese to take specific action that included working to bring about desegregation of public schools, neighborhoods, buses, and public transportation, lunch counters, restaurants, and other public accommodations. Moreover, Archbishop Iacobos instructed his flock to support legislation designed to guarantee full opportunity for all people regardless of race, color, or nationality, and to protest against legislation aimed at maintaining segregation and racial discrimination. The Department of Racial and Cultural Relations also asked its membership to discover what the policy of their denomination was regarding race relations and to study the implications of that policy in light of the Christian gospel. From January 1962 to September of 1963, the Archdiocese had not issued an, an official statement pertaining to its stand on the issue of race relations in America. It did receive inquiries 
as to what its position is on, on the issue of segregation and integration. On behalf of Archbishop Iapobos, Arthur Dorr, again, Director of Information at this time, responded to these inquiries with the following letter, and I quote, Though the Greek Orthodox Church has not issued an official statement on this subject, Archbishop Iacobos has authorized me to inform you that our church is unequivocally against segregation of any kind and believes in the full equality of all races and peoples. The Greek Orthodox Church believes, moreover, that all Americans, regardless of faith and color, should be granted equal opportunities for public education, for employment in all fields of endeavor, end quote. Archbishop Iacobos' statement in favor of racial equality and integration undoubtedly endangered his efforts to make the Orthodox faith the fourth largest faith in America, especially in the South. He knew that in the early 1960s, many Americans opposed his views on racial equality. His eminence was well aware that his stand on civil rights placed his southern parishes in a precarious position, perhaps provoking segregationists to attack them. On September 27, 1962, Murray Stedman of the National Council of Churches sent a telegram to the Archdiocese asking Archbishop Iacobos to send a personal letter to Governor Beth Barnett of Mississippi to allow a, quote, Negro to enroll in the University of Mississippi. In a memo to the Archbishop, Arthur Dorr wrote, my own opinion is that at this stage of our development, so to speak, in the South, it may not be wise for your eminence to send such a letter, to which Archbishop Iacobo <coughs> scrawled, scrolled on the memo his reply, I agree. However, when on December the 14th, 1962, the Fair Housing Committee of Wichita, Kansas, asked Archbishop Iacobus for his endorsement on a statement of conscience to declare that no qualifications about race, color, religion, or national origin be applied to prospective residents. He congratulated the committee and gladly affixed his signature to the statement. These two examples reveal the fine line that Archbishop Iacobus had to maintain, that is to stand by his convictions in support of racial equality and to protect the Southern communities from hostilities. The year 1963 was pivotal in the history of the civil rights movement as American religious institutions played a more critical role in advancing the cause. On January the 14th, the National Council of Churches, the Synagogue Council of America, the National Catholic Welfare Conference, and 67 additional religious bodies convened the National Conference on Religion and Race in Chicago, Illinois. The organizers <coughs> represented most of the religious bodies in the United States. An unprecedented 657 white and African American delegates attended the four-day conference to examine the role of religious institutions in race relations and to increase the leadership of religion in ending racial discrimination in the United States. The conference organizers invited Archbishop Iacobos to accept a vice presidency position at the conference, but His Eminence could not attend but he did instead, instead send two representatives. The outcome of the conference was not as successful as the organizers had hoped. As King biographer Taylor Branch writes, quote, the only resolution they approved, an appeal to conscience of the American people, called for no binding action by any of the participating bodies. However, the conference did succeed in resurrecting the social gospel activism of the early 20th century and encouraged religious institutions to play a more prominent role in the political sphere, especially in matters of social justice. It also introduced Martin Luther King Jr. to a new audience of potential supporters and legitimized his nonviolent methods 
as an example of faith-based activism. Finally, the conference did succeed in placing the issue of race on the agendas of future church and synagogue conventions, as it did a year later in 1964 for the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese in July at the Clergy Lady Conference. In April of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC launched the Birmingham campaign to protest the city's segregation laws and its anti-protest injunction. Disappointed at the lack of activism, he had hoped the National Conference on Religion and Race would produce and thinking that President Kennedy, that his interest in the movement was waning. King resolved to lead the protests in Birmingham that resulted in his arrest and that of thousands of African Americans. It was during his incarceration there that King penned his famous letter from Birmingham jail. With the jails filled and protesters continuing to march, Birmingham police turned high-powered fire hoses on the marchers and threatened them with police dogs. The horrific images of police attacking demonstrators, young and old alike, saturated newspapers and television screens worldwide. By May 10th, Birmingham's municipal and business leaders agreed to desegregate public areas and businesses and to hire African Americans in jobs previously denied them. Events began to unfold quickly among white religious leaders shortly after the Birmingham campaign. On June 7, the National Council of Churches established a new Commission on Religion and Race designed to allow America's premier ecumenical body to become fully and flexibly involved in the day-to-day -day struggle over racial issues. On June 11th, Governor Wallace blocked the doorway of the University of Alabama to two African-American students, but stepped aside when confronted by federalized National Guard troops. Later that evening, with images of the atrocities inflicted upon African-Americans in Birmingham, and the civil disparities that affected African Americans throughout the country fresh in his mind, President Kennedy informed the citizenry on nationwide television that he planned to introduce a civil rights bill to Congress. The next morning, Byron D. LeBeckwith murdered civil rights activist Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi. On June 17, Kennedy called an emergency White House interreligious meeting on the racial crisis, where he met J. Irwin Miller, president of the NCC. At this meeting, Miller informed the president that the council, composed of 31 Protestant, Anglican, and Orthodox denominations, committed itself only this month to a strong church-based attack in the struggle for racial justice. It has urged all church members to join in supporting the program of the Council's new Emergency Commission on Religion and Race, set up a week ago. After this meeting with the President, the NCC appointed 28 prominent religious, industrial, labor, labor and community leaders to its new Commission on Religion and Race, including Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., Victor Ruther of the UAW, and His Eminence Archbishop Iacobus. Two days later, as Medgar Evers was buried in Arlington National Cemetery, President Kennedy submitted his civil rights bill to Congress, where it remained in the House's Judiciary Committee for several months. On June 22nd of 1963, Leaders from civil rights organizations met with President Kennedy, which included Martin Luther King of the SCLC, James Far Farmer of CORE, John Lewis of SNCC, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, and Whitney Young from the National Urban League, and A. Philip Randolph. They met to discuss a mass civil rights march that would take place in Washington, D.C. that summer warning that intimidating Congress could impede the Civil Rights Bill. 
Kennedy cautiously agreed to a peaceful demonstration. The organizer set the date for August the 28th, 1963. Not all civil rights activists agreed to a mass march on the nation's capital. Like the president, many feared an outbreak of violence. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Archbishop Iacobo stated that he would not participate in the mass demonstration in Washington, despite the fact that the National Councils of Churches would be actively involved. And this is the famous march on Washington where Dr. King gave his famous I have a dream speech. His eminence said, quote, civil rights demonstrations can be futile if there is not a concurrent change in the human heart. I am for civil rights, but I think that if we believe we have some sort of moral influence over our congregations, we should limit ourselves to that task and not to try to exert influence in mass demonstrations." End quote. Archbishop Iacobus went on to say that a clergyman would be more effective in influencing his people's hearts quietly than through mass public demonstrations where they have less control of the outcome. As the fervor of the civil rights movement escalated through July and with the historic August 28th march on Washington completed, the archdiocese still had not issued an official statement on the issue of race. That was soon to change. On Sunday morning, September the 15th, four members of the KKK placed a box of dynamite near the basement of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. At 10.22 in the morning, the bomb exploded, killing four little African-American girls and injuring 22 parishioners. The outcry from this heinous act reverberated across the country. Since 1956, this was the 20th bombing perpetrated against African-American homes or churches in Birmingham. The city was at the brink of racial warfare. African Americans were furious at whites, fed up after an interminable history of discrimination, segregation, lynchings, and more recently bombings. They were also angry with Dr. King and his continual call for nonviolence in the face of such atrocities. Whites began to arm themselves in Birmingham fearing a revolt by African Americans that was imminent. Surprisingly, peace prevailed. Instead, African Americans assuaged their anger by grieving for the four little girls killed in the bombings. According to Taylor Branch, quote, the funerals produced the largest interracial collections of clergy in Birmingham history, but no city officials attended. End quote. Responding to the Birmingham bombing, the Archdiocese issued its official Greek Orthodox statement on racial equality in a press release on September the 28th of 1963. And that statement can be found at the new site of the civilrights.goarch.org. Five days before the Archdiocese issued its official statement on racial equality, Father Sotirios Gouvelis, the priest of Holy Trinity, Holy Cross, Greek Orthodox Church of Birmingham, wrote a letter to the Archbishop seeking his advice on the, quote, Negro situation, end quote, in his parish. He writes, and I quote, it seems that every time the priest mentions the word Negro in church, the president of the board of trustees has the feeling of remorse and dislike for the clergy and the Negroes. To put it mildly, it has been my task to attend meetings of the spiritual leaders of the troubled city, to discuss problems that face this dying city. It has been our obligation to meet with leaders of all denominations and color. Yet at no time have I taken a stand to offend my church and my people. 
Last Sunday, following the bombing, I made a plea to my people from the pulpit to offer contributions to the priest, money to be collected to aid in the rebuilding and to pay for the funeral and hospital bills of the dead and injured. This morning, the president of the parish council was greatly disturbed. I am not trying to be an integrationist, nor a segregationist, but a man of God. I feel and sympathize with all causes pertaining to the welfare of human beings. My request for funds was done as a Christian urging another Christian to give aid to a person in need. This brought about the wrath and threats of the president and the council that we will partition, we will petition the archbishop. If these conditions from my board persist, it can make life unbearable for a priest doing his task. I went through a period of harassment and threats from my board. It seems that members of the parish fear the wrath of the segregationists of Alabama. One cannot blame them who have lived here for many years. This morning, a group of clergymen, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews are flying to Washington to discuss the problems of my city with the President of the United States. I was asked to attend, but knowing of the stand of my council, I did not accept. At present, I requested that people of the parish contribute money to help the Negro rebuild and contribute to relieve the agony of the bereaved families. Money cannot buy lives nor replace the daughters that were killed. If it be wrong to request that funds be sent to the bombed church fund, kindly let me know so I can inform my people." End quote. Archbishop Iacobus responded to Father Grubelis' request for advice on October the 8th. Via Arthur Gore, referencing the Archdiocese's recently published statement on racial equality. Additionally, Archbishop Iacobos re recommended that the matter of contribution should be done on a voluntary basis and not officially in church. This would prevent objections from members of the community, community for the various reasons would be opposed to a collection. Let those who want to give and send money directly to the proper authorities do so. The exchange between Father Gubelis and the Archbishop reveals the sensitive and painful nature of race relations for a white ethnic community in the South and the pragmatic solution offered by His Eminence. It indicates that within the Greek American community of Birmingham, there existed segregationists and integrationists. Father Gubelis strived to prevent the race issue from splintering his parish. While still endeavoring to help the families victimized by the church bombing. As his letter to the Archbishop indicates, the strategy and his priesthood compelled him to help those in need. Archbishop Iacobus condemned discrimination and segregation, yet he wished to protect the recently assimilated Greek community from potential violent reprisals of Southern white segregationists. This helps explain his pragmatic advice not to allow the parish to take up collections officially. Efforts to bring the Civil Rights Bill to a vote in Congress came to a halt in November of the 22nd of 1963. The emotional trauma and political uncertainty of the nation following the assassination of President Kennedy placed the Civil Rights Bill on the back burner. Archbishop Iacobos and other religious leaders, together with civil rights activists, mounted a spirited and vigorous campaign to move the bill through Congress during the early months of 1964. In April, Archbishop Iacobus convened the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops, SCOBA, and on April the 24th of 1964, issued their official statement on civil rights. Within days of issuing the SCOBA statement, and at one of the openings of the 1964 World's Fair in New York,
Archbishop Iacobos declared, quote, the New York World's Fairground offer to us the battleground for a new and concerted effort to overcome bigotry and division and serve God's people as God's servants, end quote. As pressure on Washington continued to mount into the early summer of 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act on June 19. On July 1st, the plenary session of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese's 17th Biannual Clergy Lady Conference convened in Denver, Colorado, under the presidency of Archbishop Iacobos, and adopted the SCOBA statement as the official position of the Greek Orthodox Church in America on the issue of civil rights. The next day, President Johnson signed the landmark Civil Rights Act. In an encyclical to his priests, his eminence wrote, I quote, it is our duty, the duty of, of the clergy to enlighten and to try to convince the Christians we serve that the enforcement of this law is their sacred obligation. Equality is not a political doctrine. It is a Christian axiom based on the Bible, taught and reinforced by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who never practiced discrimination, political, social, or religious." End quote. The results of the 1964 election revealed that the Civil Rights Act had not gone far enough. Few African Americans voted in the southern states because they were unable to register. Civil rights organizations were working to register African Americans in cities like Selma, Alabama for at least two years with little success. Of the 15,000 African Americans residing in Selma's Dallas County, only 300 had registered. In adjacent Perry, Perry County, the number of African American registered voters was similar. Blacks comprised 80% of the population in the area immediately south of Dallas County, yet none had registered to vote. In response, civil rights leaders mobilized and pressured the federal government for a Voting Rights Act at the beginning of 1965. President Johnson felt it was too soon after the Civil Rights Act to introduce voting reform legislation which prompted Martin Luther King Jr. and others into action. Among these was the NCC's Commission on Religion and Race and one of its leaders, Archbishop Iacobos. Dr. King and other civil rights organizers arrived in Selma in January of 1965 to begin planning their strategy to raise the nation's awareness of the need for a Voting Rights Act. It would be a strategy consistent with King's belief of nonviolent civil disobedience. They would distribute leaflets, hold mass meetings, organize protest marches, and fill the county jails until the country realized the voting injustices inflicted upon blacks throughout the South. Tensions between whites and blacks continued to mount in Selma and in its, in its adjacent counties in January and February of 1965. A nighttime march in the nearby city of Marion erupted in violence, which led to the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson. In the wake of the horrific events that unfolded in Marion, civil rights organizers planned a peaceful march from Selma to the state capital of Montgomery on Sunday, March 7th. The intention of the march was to protest African Americans' inability to register to vote and the escalating violence perpetrated against them as they attempted to do so. In the absence of Dr. King, the march would begin from Selma's Brown Chapel, proceed across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and continue along Route 80 to Montgomery. 600 marchers left Brown Chapel and made it as far as the Edmund Pettus Bridge, on the outskirts of town. There awaiting them were hundreds of Alabama state troopers, local policemen, and a volunteer mounted posse comprised of local segregationists, 
flaunting their bull whips, rubber tubing wrapped in barbed wire and clubs. As the marchers approached, the state police commander ordered the advance. Immediately, law enforcement officers and posse men broke ranks and attacked the marchers with tear gas and swinging clubs. They continued their attack, pursuing the terrified marchers back across the bridge and well into Selma's black neighborhood. When the pursuit ended, more than 50 people were hospitalized. Hundreds were injured. All were terrified. And the nation, viewing the spectacle on television, was horrified at what would later be known as Bloody Sunday. Learning of the atrocities from his home in Atlanta, Dr. King immediately sent telegrams to prominent church leaders across the country calling upon them to join him in a minister's march from Selma to Montgomery on Tuesday, March the 9th. In response, hundreds of ministers, priests, rabbis, and nuns from across the country descended upon Selma for a second march and with them hundreds of journalists, photographers, and television cameramen. One of the ministers who arrived was Unitarian Minister James Reeb, who flew from Boston to join the march. At almost 2.30 p.m. on March 9, only two days after the horrific spectacle of the first Selma to Montgomery march, Dr. King and hundreds of clergy led a march of 3,000 from Brown Chapel towards the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When they reached the crest of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they saw hundreds of state troopers barring their way at the foot of the bridge. When they came within 50 feet of the troops, Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Police ordered the marchers to halt. Dr. King, sensing that the imminence of an attack and a fearing of the first attempted march, a repeat of that, requested if he and the marchers could kneel and pray, which Major Cloud permitted. After a brief prayer, Dr. King rose and led the marchers back into Selma. The second attempted march to Montgomery failed, yet it succeeded in that no one was hurt, at least not until that evening, when su suspected members of the KKK beat the Reverend James Reeve and two other Unitarian ministers, Reeb would die two days later. News of Reverend Reeb's death made headlines across the nation. Archbishop Iacobo sent a telegram to Mrs. Reeb on March 12th, which stated in part, quote, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese and our communicants extend deepest condolences and sympathy on the tragic death of your beloved husband a minister of God who fought oppression of human rights and dignity and died heroically on the battlefield of mankind." End quote. A memorial service for Reverend Reeb was set for Monday, March 15th at Brown Chapel in Selma. The intended service was to include eulogies in the chapel, followed by a procession to the Dallas County Courthouse where prayers and a wreath would be placed at the courthouse doors. However, due to escalating racial hostilities, the procession could not occur because of a court-ordered injunction that precluded any march from taking place in Selma. On March 13th, the Reverend Robert Spike, Executive Director of the Commission on Religion and Race of the National Council of Churches, sent a telegram to Archbishop Iacobus inviting him as a leader of the Greek Orthodox Church in the Americas and one of the presidents of the World Council of Churches and as a vice president of the National Council of Churches to attend the memorial service in Selma on Monday. His eminence consulted with his staff and advisors who strongly recommended that he not attend the memorial due to the violent atmosphere in Alabama and that his life would be certainly in grave danger. Nevertheless, his eminence decided to go. On Monday morning, March 15th, Archbishop Iacobos, Father George Bakopoulos, 
along with 20 other distinguished clergymen of the Commission on Religion and Race, boarded a plane chartered by the National Council of Churches and flew to Alabama. Upon arriving in Selma, the pilot opted to land his plane in a cow pasture outside of the city as racial tensions were still quite high. Archbishop Iacobos, Father Bakopoulos, and the NCC delegates proceeded to Brown Chapel in the black neighborhood of Selma. Mourners filled the chapel beyond its capacity as hundreds of sympathizers awaited outside in the doorway while others peered through the windows. Upon his arrival, His Eminence was directed to a seat on the dais since he was the highest ranking cleric present. Clergymen of all denominations participated in the memorial service, awaiting the arrival of the main eulogist, Dr. King. His Eminence remembered how surprised local blacks were to see a Greek Orthodox Archbishop in his black robes. Dr. King arrived three hours late and delivered a stirring eulogy for Reverend Reed and Jimmy Lee Jackson. As King concluded, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy mounted the dais to announce that the U.S. District Court Judge Daniel Thomas of Mobile had lifted the injunction and permitted the march to the Dallas County Courthouse to proceed. The shocked congregants cheered and wept with joy at the prophetic-like pronouncement as they prepared for a long-awaited march to the courthouse. Just outside the doorway of the chapel, King paused to shake hands and speak briefly with Archbishop Iacobus, whom he remembered meeting on his first trip abroad to Geneva, Switzerland, when his eminence served as a representative of the Ecumenical Patriarchy 10 years before. Archbishop Iacobus later commented that he and Dr. King had walked along Lake Geneva together and how surprised people were to see a black minister for the first time. As they embarked, a little six or seven year old black girl looked up at the distinguished archbishop in his black robes, held his hand and told him not to worry. His eminence later remembered looking at this young child and thought she wanted to ask him, will the day ever come when I'll be able to hold any white person's hand and walk with them. At 5.08 p.m., the procession of nearly 4,000 walking three abreast began from the steps of Brown Chapel and proceeded through a white neighborhood until it reached the downtown district where the Dallas County Courthouse was located. Dr. King held a purple and white wreath and led the march with Archbishop Iacobus on one side and Reverend Ralph Abernathy and Andrew Young on the other. The eight block route took approximately 25 minutes to walk. Hundreds of reporters and cameramen followed the solemn procession to the courthouse steps. The police formed a protective ring around the marchers as they advanced. Car horns blared from angry motorists at each intersection as the procession passed, undoubtedly protesting both the obstruction to traffic and its purpose. Quote, as we walked toward the courthouse, there were so many ugly faces staring at us, Iaco was told, a New York Times reporter. The whites' spirits were so poisoned by hate and bias. But when you believe in the rightness of what you're doing, you discount fear." End quote. The presence of hundreds of police officers and the many clergy of all faiths contributed to the peacefulness of the march. As Jack Nelson of the Los Angeles Times reported, most of the whites who ventured onto the streets seemed almost awed by the sight of so many ministers, priests, and nuns among the marchers except for one man who spat in the lens of a TV camera and another who shouted obscenities from a nearby service station, there were no incidents. Several, several whites along the route stood in doorways of buildings and laughed when they saw cameramen running ahead 
of yet an, another long series of marches. The laughs faded. The expressions of many changed to awe when they saw the imposing figure of Archbishop Iacobus, his dark eyes as bright as the gold top of the staff he carried, his beard gray, and his thick eyebrows as dark as his flowing vestments." End quote. Just as Dr. King, Archbishop Iacobus, and other dignitaries reached the courthouse steps, they turned and faced the thousands who had followed them. A Life magazine journalist photographed this iconic moment, which appeared on the front cover of the magazine's March 26, 1965 issue. Before Dr. King spoke, Dallas County Sheriff Jim Clark locked the doors from the inside and turned off the lights of the courthouse. The marchers assembled on Alabama Avenue between the courthouse and the federal building surrounded by police. 200 white spectators assembled across the street for undetermined reasons. Dr. King delivered a brief eulogy while the car horn blared in the background as he spoke. He followed his eulogy with a prayer for the Reverend Reed, Jimmy Lee Jackson, and other fallen civil rights martyrs. The memorial concluded with all singing, We Shall Overcome. As darkness settled and the service ended, the people dispersed back to Brown Chapel. When they had gone, the courthouse door was unlocked, and a hand reached from behind it to remove the wreath and lock the doors again. With the events in Selma concluded, Archbishop Iacobos and Father Bacopoulos departed. His eminence to South Carolina and Father Bacopoulos back to New York City. His eminence issued a statement to the press that read in part, I quote, I came to this memorial service because I believe this is an appropriate occasion not only to dedicate myself as well as our Greek Orthodox communicants to the noble cause for which our friend, the Reverend James Reed, gave his life, but also in order to show our willingness to continue this fight against prejudice, bias, and persecution. In this God-given cause, I feel sure that I have the full understanding, support of our Greek Orthodox faithful of America. For our Greek Orthodox Church and our people fully understand from our heritage and our tradition such sacrificial involvements. Our church has never hesitated to fight when it felt it must for the rights of mankind and many of our churchmen have been in the forefront of these battles time and time again." End quote. The trip to Selma gave his eminence an opportunity to visit one of his parishes in the South and to learn that not all members of his flock supported his beliefs in the civil and voting rights of African Americans. Without his customary entourage, Archbishop Iacobus flew to Charleston, South Carolina his first time visiting the Greek Orthodox community of approximately 120 families. To his surprise, no one from the community came to the airport to formally receive and welcome him. Later that evening, alone in his hotel room, his eminence received threatening phone calls throughout the night, expressing their anger and opposition at his presence in Selma earlier that day. However, Archbishop Iacobo soon disregarded the disappointing phone calls when he watched President Lyndon Johnson introduce his voting rights bill to Congress that same evening. His eminence believed that the President's address was a direct result of the events that had transpired in Selma that day, of which he felt blessed to be a part of. The next day, Archbishop Iacobo sent a telegram to President Johnson expressing the feelings of gratitude and admiration of my people. He also delivered remarks on CBS's nationwide radio program, The World Tonight, saying, quote, the commitment that our president made before our nation last night renews the faith of our people in equality, democracy, and human dignity. The orderly demonstration in Selma yesterday guarantees the peaceful solution to the problem that has done so much damage to the image of the United States here and abroad." End quote. 
Upon returning to the Archdiocese in New York City, Archbishop Iacobus received many letters, both in support and in opposition of his presence in Selma. Though the number of letters in support of his Selma appearance far outnumbered those in opposition, he was especially grieved that for the first time in his life, he received threatening letters from his own people, people of his own faith, who bestowed upon him, quote, the title of traitor. Over the months and years that followed the historic events in Selma, increasing numbers of Americans, both Greek and non-Greek, appreciated and expressed their admiration for Archbishop Iacobus' role in the civil rights movement. When he became Archbishop in North and South America in 1959, he was the leader of an inward-looking ethnic church. During the pivotal years of 1963 and 65, he thrust his immigrant church into the national limelight, transforming its ancient Christian faith into an American institution that all could revere. Many scholars and historians consider the events that transpired in Selma that year the crowning moment of the civil rights movement. The marches that took place in Selma visually and essentially legitimized the fact that the issue of civil rights was not only an African-American cause, but one shared by all people, regardless of race or creed, who loved freedom, liberty, and democracy. Archbishop Iacobus knew that voting does more than give people a voice in their government. Voting erases their invisibility. Inspired by his Orthodox Christian faith, Archbishop Iacobus believed that voting is more than a right or an expression of citizenship. It is a declaration of one of God's created humanity. It is, I would argue, just as much a human right as it is a civil right. His eminence understood this long before he walked with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, when he himself grew up as a discriminated minority in Turkey. For him, it was unconscionable that in the land founded on freedom and democracy, that inequality and prejudice should prevail. To this end, Archbishop Iacobos labored tirelessly for almost four decades on the human and civil rights causes for all peoples, earning him the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1980, along with Dr. Martin Luther King from President Jimmy Carter. In conclusion, it is good and proper for us to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Archbishop Iacobus' Civil Rights March in Selma with the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and to memorialize our late Archbishop on the 10th anniversary of his repose in the Lord. Civil rights, voting rights, human rights, and race relations continue to be critical issues relevant today. Archbishop Iacobus knew long before his decision to go to Selma, and our holy Greek Orthodox faith continues to profess that God created all human beings in his image and likeness. God did not create Greeks, Italians, Germans, or any ethnic or racial group. He created human beings. Today, scientists, scholars, and theologians around the globe remind us that race and ethnicity are human, social, cultural constructions. They are not biological. And history has proven that whatever is humanly constructed can be deconstructed and reconstructed over time. Therefore, let us each take pride and appreciate our respective national and ethnic heritage, but never at the expense of depriving others of their humanity or their human and civil rights. In this way, we honor 
His Eminence Archbishop Iacobus, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and countless others, while carrying into the future their legacy of love for God and all people. May their memory be eternal.